We are so honored to have them with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage Robert Gibbs and Carl Rove. We survived that. I'm trying to save you from catching on fire. <laughs> Welcome. That was a little overdone, don't you think? <laughs> no, no. Fireworks I don't think for the so. two of us. I think it's a, a great honor to have both of you and here together, which is wonderful. Yeah, good. don't tell anybody, but I actually like the guy. All right. Well, yeah, we won't. It's a private secret. This is off the record, right? Right. Exactly. How do you feel about him? I look <laughs> the same way. Stop no, no. with the good thing right here. No, no, so. <laughs> Uh, we become friends, which is, uh, again, something you shouldn't get out of this room. Yeah. So. I think it it's actually... It did terrible damage to his reputation. Yeah, right. But it actually says a lot, and it's a wonderful thing, and it's something that the country should be able to do a little bit more of, regardless of whether we have differences of opinion in certain areas, yeah. right? Yeah. So, Absolutely. is that true? Yes. Well, you know, the two of you have had such incredible careers, and um, I'm sure a lot of the people here would love to spend hours and hours asking you questions and learning from you, but you know, you both started in a fiercely competitive political arena, both at a very young age, and of course, worked your way up to the pinnacle of power and influence in this country, and you both served men who beat the odds and became successful and achieved the presidency of the United States, and I, I think that a lot of people here who are challenged by different things in their lives and their careers would like to know from both of you and your personal opinions, how do you overcome obstacles like that? What do you think is the key to overcoming obstacles and becoming successful, successful making it to the top? Can we start with you? Yeah. Well, for, first, I mean, um, I, you know, I didn't come from much when my family was not affluent. They were, any, they were not political, but I've always been interested in politics. And I had a high school teacher who said, if you want an A in my class, you got to go get involved in a political campaign. Mm -hmm. And I did. And I walked in the headquarters of the campaign, and there was a campaign manager, and he said, you're in charge of your high school. And uh, I think the lesson of that is take your opportunities. Because you know, if I hadn't done that, uh, you know, I had, I wouldn't, everything else followed from that. I got involved in that campaign. People saw what I did. Two years later, they offered me a job uh, in another campaign while I was in college. And then I got an offer because of what I did in that campaign, worked hard, kept my head down, focused on the job. I got offered a job in Washington. Uh, did that for a year and a half, and then a new chairman came into the Republican National Committee, a guy named George H.W. Bush, and uh, he, I, I knew him for about six weeks, and he offered me a job. So, I mean, I think in life, I, you can't plan your life, but you got to take your opportunities and make the most of them. You know, stay focused on the mission, stay focused on the job, do work as hard as you can, and I've always found if you work hard for some reason or another, it's just sort of things open up beyond that. And. Uh, you know, it's also remember the people who gave you the opportunity. Um, I, thir decades after I'd walked into that headquarters in Salt Lake, I was sitting in the west wing of the White House, and I got to pick up the telephone and call a guy and say to him, thank you for your service to the country as chief of staff to a United States senator, as an advisor to several presidents, as a, a you know, Washington lobbyist. Now the president of the United States would like you to become ambassador to a foreign country on behalf of our country. And it was the same guy who gave me my shot decades before. It was sort of a sweet moment. Wow, that's, that's amazing, about building relationships. And you never know where they're going to sure. lead. Exactly. Can you just share your thoughts on that? Well, look, I, I think in life or in business and politics, obstacles are only obstacles if you define them as such. Um, there's certainly everybody in this country and everybody in this world has certain challenges. Uh, but an impediment to you being able to accomplish something I think is only an impediment if you believe it's an impediment, right? Uh, look, Barack Obama, uh, when 
he was growing up only saw his dad twice. Uh, that could have been an impediment for him if he would have decided that was going to impede what he wanted to do in his life. Um, much like Carl, my parents weren't political. I got involved in politics because I had an interest in it. Uh, and when I finally got an opportunity to be an intern for my local congressman in Washington, I remember uh, a lot of people asking me, well, your parents must know people if you got this job. And I said, no, I, I, I just worked hard and I hope to prove to the people that gave me this opportunity that they uh, didn't pick somebody that may have known somebody, they picked somebody that they thought was going to work hard and, and do a good job. And, I think, again, I think the most important thing, though, is understand you have challenges, but obstacles are only the, there if you define them as something that impedes your ability not to go beyond it. All how we perceive it in, in that way. And, you know, you both had uh, a real insider's view about how these leaders and many other leaders as well handle extreme crisis. And I know for you, once one was watching President Bush and how he handled the events of 9-11. And then for you, it's, you know, watching President Obama handle this recession that we're going through. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, because of what the country is going through right now, what do you think the keys are to prevailing, keeping your attitude up during these times of unbelievable crisis? Um, uh, yeah, they, they look, 9-11 is like nothing we've ever seen, at least not in our lifetimes. I'm, I'm the guy that walked over to President Bush at 8.48 a.m. on a bright September morning and said, Mr. President, plane's flown in the World Trade Center. And um, I was with him the entire day. And uh, it was a remarkable day. I remember you saw the famous photograph of Andy Card came in and told the president's chief of staff, told the president that a second plane had flown in, whispered in his ear. What you didn't see was hap what happened about five or six minutes later. The president's sitting in a room with 40 or 50, you know, fourth, third and fourth graders doing a reading demonstration. And so he had to make a quick decision. Shall I get up and walk out of the room with all these television cameras and everything, or shall I wait until this thing finishes in a few moments and then leave? which he decided to do, and he walked into the staff hold, the room nearby where the president's aides were waiting and watching the television. And this was a room filled with military aides carrying the nuclear football code, you know, national security staff, really seasoned people, but you could tell there was some anxiety in the room, and he walked in, and I've known him a long time. We met when we were in our 20s. So I, I've known him a long time, and I, I remember him being preternaturally calm and cold. And he, I remember exactly what he said, first words that he, as he walked in, in a very calm voice, he said, we're at war, give me the director of the FBI and the vice president. I rode to the airport with him in the limousine, two agents in front, he and I sitting in the back seat, and it was right during the ride to the airport that the president got a phone call, and I could only hear one side of the conversation, but when he said the words, as Rumsfeld alive, I knew it was a bad conversation, it was about the strike on the Pentagon. And I remember looking out the window of the limousine, and we're going 85 miles an hour in a, in a big, huge limousine. And I realized that there was a police car. If I could have rolled down the window, I could have reached out and touched a police car. There were police cars surrounding the, the, the limousine going 80, 85 miles an hour. I could have touched it if I could have rolled down the window. I later talked to the Secret Service guy and said, why were there cars surrounding Air Force, I mean, surrounding the limousine? He said, we were afraid that there might be a car bomber, and so we wanted to have those cars there so that if they tried to intersect with a motorcade, that car, the police car, could force the bomb to go off six to eight feet further away from the limousine, thereby protecting, the, giving the president a better chance of surviving. And I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing in the seat back seat of the car? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the military and the Secret Service did not want the president to return to Washington because they said, we can't, you know, we don't know what the threat is. We can't, the, the airspace around Washington is not secure. Finally, he told him, I'm coming back, which was really important. He said to him, I need to speak to the country the, tonight from the Oval Office, not from some bunker in Nebraska. We were at, out in Omaha, and he said, I want to sleep in my own bed, which was his jocular way of ending the conversation. And, and he was mad. I've known him a long time, and he rarely gets mad, but he was mad because he, he knew what he wanted to do, and they kept giving him good reasons why, why not. And I remember we flew back, as we flew back into Washington, I happened to be walking into the hallway of Air Force One. He was taking a 20-minute power nap, and I walked into the hallway on Air Force One, and as I, walked, as I walked in the hallway, 
I looked out the window and I plowed an F-16 fighter and took up station at the wingtip of the, of the airplane. And one of my colleagues came running up the aisle saying, get your camera, get your camera, take a picture, take a picture. Because it was really cool. I mean, you're in this big plane and up plows a fighter and takes up station. You can literally make out the... And so I'm taking pictures and suddenly both of us were sort of excited. Wasn't this cool? And then we realized this was not cool. This was the last line of defense. As we came plowing back into Washington, that pilot, and there was one also on the right wing tip, their job was to put themselves and their craft between whatever threat there was in Air Force One. I, I was walking through the Atlanta airport a couple years later, and a guy came up to me and said, you and I were together on September 11th. I said, how's that? And he said, I was the pilot who took up station on the left wing tip. I said, I put your picture in my book, mm -hmm. which I did, a picture of the guy. And I can't make out his features, but he looks damn good. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, it's, it's in moments like that you see the real character of somebody. And Bush was cool and calm and collected and focused, which was the way he was for the next seven years. He knew what history had given him as a responsibility. I remember, uh, shut up in just a second, but... It's a I, good story. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I remember um, I was sitting there in the private office on Air Force One, and he got a call. And he listened for a few moments, and he said, yes. And listened a few moments more and said, yes. And listened a few moments longer and said, you have my authorization. And he hung up the phone and Andy Card was there and he looked at Andy and I and said, I've just given authorization for the military to shoot down any aircraft inbound to a critical target not under control of its crew. And I remember the evenness in his voice and I was shocked at, you know, what a horrible thing to have to authorize. When we came back into Washington, we landed at Andrews Air Force Base, and we didn't make the normal, you know, sort of here comes the airplane like this. We were like this in a 747. I'm sort of looking down at the president across the desk like this, trying to be cool and calm and collected. Yes, no, nothing awkward is going on, Mr. President. And at the last moment, Colonel Tillman, the pilot Air Force One, pancakes it onto the runway. They were afraid that there would be some guy with a shoulder launch missile to take down the plane. And we flew back to the White House in Marine One. And normally, you go to about six, 800 feet, and you go about 70 miles an hour. And there are three choppers. And they're going like this. They all look alike. So it's sort of like a, the, you know, what's, where's the real Air Marine One? You know, the three choppers look alike. So it's like, and then they go back to the White House. And just as you get to the White House, two of them peel off. Well, we got in the choppers that day. We didn't go to six, 800,000 feet. We got five feet off the tarmac at, at Andrews Air Force Base and made our way off of the base by maneuvering down the golf course. And we, when we got to the fence line, they put these choppers, so we, I mean, they just floored it. And we were going 150, 165 miles an hour, hugging the ground and coming in, I mean, literally going down valleys, just screaming down these valleys. No attempt to do an aerial ballet. Come over the last ridge before the Potomac River, come down, and we were literally flying through the buildings on Bowling Air Force Base, looking up at the tops of the buildings. We're literally making our way down the streets of Bowling Air Force Base. Looks like we're gonna pancake into the Potomac River, and at the last minute, the pilot makes a hard right to head north into the White House, which in a helicopter is really sort of a weird sensation. And when he did, the Pentagon came into view, and there was a cloud of smoke, a plume of smoke, blown from the west to the east, and we went through it, and the president looked out the window and broke the silence. Nobody had said a single word since we left Andrews, and he said, take a look, you're looking at the face of war in the 21st century. And we came in over the, by the base of the Washington Monument in over the trees and landed on the South Lawn. And it, it changed America. It changed anybody who was, who was alive that day was different afterwards, and particularly if you were you know, on Air Force One. Thank you very much. Would you like to share? Um, yeah, no, it's a, and I mean, that's an incredible story. I've never heard. Incredible. Well, I, I think the common traits on in successful leaders are some of what Carl touched about, and that is to be sort of calm, cool, and collected in that sense of crisis. Uh, President Obama through, and we're still going through a lot of it, but when we first got into the White House when 800,000 jobs are being shed, and you know, we literally would come out of meetings, and I remember coming out of a meeting and somebody had said they weren't sure if the ATM for a certain bank if the ATMs for that bank would work in the morning. We went home with this sort of not knowing what would happen the next day sort of thing. Uh, and I was always struck by the fact that the president was remarkably even keeled and never too 
uh, excited if things went well and never too down if things went poorly, uh, just remarkably even keeled and focused on the long arc of the mission, not getting distracted along the way by, by things that come at you, but focused uh, on the end result and understanding what the path was to get to that end result and the steps that every decision had to make to go forward. I, I think the most stark example that I remember sitting through were the, was the last meeting, uh, whether we decided, whether quite frankly, whether GM and Chrysler would be saved. And the president walks in and he's sitting on one side of the Roosevelt Room and there's a team of economists on the other side and we're going through the decisions. You know, there's a few hundred thousand people that work in the auto plants. There's several hundred thousand people that work for auto plant manufacturers. If one of them went, quite frankly, all of them would go. And we had to make a series of decisions. He had to make a series of decisions. And, and I remember he asked the economists certain questions. And he, he asked them things like, if they, if, if, if they get this money, what are the chances? What, what's the likelihood? How can they how can they get out of this mess that we're in? How are they going to sell cars in an economy that's already going poorly? And I remember in dealing with GM and Chrysler, he asked the economists, if everything goes well, if they get a partner, if they get the money, if everything goes as well as it could, what are the chances that both of them survive? And the economist said, 51-49. 51-49. But the president knew what the right thing to do was. It wasn't altogether the most popular thing to do, and it certainly wasn't a popular thing then, um, but it was the right thing to do, uh, to make the decision. And now GM is not only the strongest auto company uh, uh, in this country, but it's one of the, it is the leading auto company in the world. Uh, Fortune 500 came out with its Fortune 500 ratings yesterday, and it's number five, and they have an enormous, uh, you should applaud, um, because it's never just one presidential decision. It's a whole series of efforts by men and women, whether it's in our military to keep people safe, uh, whether it's uh, hardworking Americans uh, who face adversity but never let that define them. They overcome it, uh, and I think they have that clarity of vision, too. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, you all appreciate hearing that because I think everybody in this room and every business owner in here, every owner, every employee, I mean, everybody's going through these challenges right now. And just to try to stay calm, stay focused on the solution. I mean, hearing how the leadership of our country and the leaders that we respect have handled it, I think is, is it incredibly helpful to hear a little bit of the inside of that, yes? Thank you for those. Listen, I, w I would like to ask you a question because you know, you're know you revered um, as a master strategist and a lot of your success in the political realm is really attributed to your ability to develop these brilliant strategies that you have. I mean, that's what you're known for and respected for. So maybe you could talk a little bit about strategy in business and what you feel is the most important aspect to creating a winning strategy for a business. Yeah. Well, I, I think there are, there are five keys to it. First of all, you have to have a very concrete goal. You need to have well-defined what it is you want to achieve. And you need to be able to see a pathway to it. In politics, obviously, it's to get a majority of the vote. And you have to you know, sort of think outside the box sometimes on how you're going to get that. But you've got to have a clear understanding of the sea in which you swim. You know, what is the, in the politics, what's the political landscape look like? In, the, in, in a business pursuit, what's your market look like? You need to have a, a clarity of the steps that are necessary in order to achieve the goal. It's not just simply, oh, this is our goal, but you have to work out what it is that you're going to do to achieve that goal. And you have to think ahead. You have to play, you know, chess a couple of moves ahead so that, you know, the markets are going to have reaction, consumers are going to have a reaction, your competitors are going to do something, and you've got to think about how that all is going to play out and figure out, is, are the steps that I think I need to take uh, going to be the steps that give me the best shot of getting there? 
And then you have to take that vision and share it with the people who have to execute it. In a business, in a political campaign, in any great enterprise, you can't do it all yourself. You have to share that vision throughout your entire team so the team has an awareness of how, of how you're going to execute it. And then finally, you have to have the ability to be nimble and quick because Napoleon once said, you know, who was a great planner, Napoleon was, you know, would plan out these grand campaigns, and he said, you know, a battle plan barely survives the first contact with the enemy. Now, he said it, frankly, a little bit more than what was Jean Tourdain, but it was, it was everything sounds so much better in French. I don't know. It's just like, la French fry. Yeah, I'm much better. French toast. Yeah. Baguette. You know. Anyway, but I, thought, I think that's right. And you need, to, you need to have in place the ability to listen. You have to have the ability, you have to have a process by which you can constantly evaluate your progress towards the uh, towards the goal, not only metrics, are the numbers working, but also a process by which key people in a team can make, can make, can discuss making changes, and you have to be nimble enough to change it, keeping, in, keeping the goal, but finding, you know, making modifications in the path towards the goal. You know, most political campaigns fail because they never have an idea of what they, of how they, they have no strategy. We're going to run. You know, it's sort of like, you know, Andy Rooney, let's put on a play, you know, one of those 1930s movies. You have, to have a, it ha, you have to have a plan to be successful in politics, and I think, frankly, it be successful in, in almost any endeavor, particularly business. I think it's a wonderful analogy to use chess as, as you know, a metaphor, because I, I think a lot of people do. We have a lot of people in this room that are, are aspiring entrepreneurs and would like to be their, their own boss and have a business, and so I think that's a wonderful thing to keep in our minds about utilizing that, yeah, to think ahead, you know, ahead. and no matter what the other yeah. side does, you can adjust right, and whatnot. Right. If I could ask, um, if you could just share, because, um, you know, it's one thing to become successful, and obviously both of you have been very successful, but then again, staying successful, or in a political campaign, remaining in the White House, it's a whole nother element. Sure. And maybe you could just talk about what you think the key elements are, the secrets to, once you achieve the success, staying there and maintaining that consistent, right. enduring success. Well, look, I think the first lesson uh, is to be humble. Uh, we were given a remarkable privilege to serve the country and to serve a president. Uh, but I think if you begin to think this is about you, uh, you lose your focus. I, I remember uh, some people will write staffers at the White House like they will write the president. And I remember walking out of my office one day and I picked up a postcard and my assistant said, don't read that, which made me want to read that. So. <laughs> I, I picked it up, and, and, and there's, there's no salutation, there's no return address, there's just some handwritten words, and it said, um, if you lost 40 pounds, you'd be a skinny buffoon. Now, the good news is it was not from Des Moines. <laughs> I, I think that's one. But I didn't, I laughed. I, I laughed, right? And my assistant is freaked out, and I said, let me have the postcard. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it on my desk. And I kept it on my desk the rest of my days in the White House to be humble at the ability and the approach to do that. I don't think anybody is successful without having a really great team around them. And in having a really great team around you, you have to be invested not just in your success, but in their success. And I think all too many times we get sort of competitive in that success. And we don't want or don't think about bringing others along in having them gain experience and that we become successful when they too become successful. So help open doors for those that are on your team that are helping you be successful. And take more than a passive interest in them becoming successful uh, in the days and the weeks and the months ahead because if you're strong as a team and you're humble, you have, I think, a much better opportunity to stay uh, in a successful place uh, than if you don't. It's a wonderful lesson, yes. You can applaud that for sure. And, and every and the, athlete. Um, and the good news is, yeah. uh, you know, if you work in the White House, there are these little boxes of red, white, and blue M&Ms. And since I don't eat those every day anymore, I'm much skinnier, <laughs> not necessarily 40 pounds. Hey, but yes. hey. That postcard was meant for me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Not you. He's the guy who rides the mountain bike. <laughs>
Well, you know, every single athlete and coach we've had, it's the same thing. They just talk about the team play, regardless of whether it's in politics or in sports or whatever the case may be. So thank you for sharing that. You know, one quick thing. I learned if you want to instill those values in your team, you better exhibit them. Mm -hmm. If you know, humility, you want your team to be humble. Right. You want your team to listen carefully. You want your team to play well with others. You want your team to have integrity. And if they're going to have it, you have to demonstrate it from the top. I mean, I once, when I worked for George W. Bush, I was, George H. W. Bush, I was 22 years old. And one thing that he'd say, you know, he would write these little cards to people saying, thanks for being nice to me, you know, thanks for, you know, driving me, thanks for, you know, hosting me. And I thought, this is a weird habit. But, uh, you know, he, he, he said, you ought to do it. You ought to get in the habit of doing it. And I do it even today. And, and why? Because he's right. It's a common human courtesy that people appreciate. So it was a lesson to me. He was doing something in order to help train me about how to be a better person, to show courtesy and humility, and, and to thank people for helping them out in the everyday things through the contact that you have. And it was an important broader lesson. If you want them to have those characteristics, you better exemplify them yourself. I've heard that so much. Lead by example. You know, people will work for a living but die for recognition and appreciation. And those little bits of appreciation go such a long way in in a company and in a business. Thank you. That's a, such an important point. You know, I think the other thing that in the room today is because the economy is going through the challenge it is, and people working very hard, maybe harder than they were in the past, to even maintain where they are. I think that a lot of people would like to hear your. Um, strategy if it is one or, or how you deal with your personal life and balancing your work life and your personal life because obviously you're both very successful and you spend a lot of time um, you know in your careers but how do you have that healthy balance between those two areas of your lives if we could finish up with that I think it'd be nice to to share because if we lose that then what does the business really mean if we lose our personal relationships you know go ahead uh, first of all, let me brag on my pal here. I, I like the fact that when we travel together, one of the first things he talks about is what he's doing with his son. I think that's an important lesson. You, you know, we, 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 when we look at our work and our business, we say, I've got these tasks that are, are, are involved in my business. Well, we've got these tasks that are involved in our lives as well. Now, look, I'm, I'm not the best person to tell you how to live a good life. I mean, I'm please, I've made so many mistakes, I can't believe it. I'm still alive. But... You know, it does strike me that, that if you're successful at balancing work and your personal life, it's because you treat your personal life with the same kind of seriousness and passion that you bring to your business. And you gotta, you gotta start with that, making that balance yourself. And you also have to make that balance for the people who work for you. Look, I, 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 the average tenure of a senior White House aide is 18 months. I was in the White House for nearly seven years. It was not an accident. It was because Bush said, you're no good to me if you burn out. You're no good to me if you're, the, strains, the stresses and strains on your families require you to go. I've got to replace you and train somebody else up. So don't think you're impressing me if you're here at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night and you don't need to be. Don't come in here on the weekends unless you need it. If you've got a meeting, have it at your house. Don't come into the White House. They, people have to dress up, go through security. You know, it's a pain in the posterior. So to have, they'll enjoy being able just to boom into your house, you know, wearing their blue jeans and get done with it. You, you know, don't waste the opportunity that you have to work here by, by, by running yourself into the wall. And it was a very important lesson. And, uh, you know, I can see, you know, Robert was, has been with President Obama since the, 2000, since the start of the 2004 campaign. He's lived the whirlwind for, you know, eight years. And when you go do a presidential campaign and then go into the White House, it's even, it's the, it is the most difficult and stressful situation short of athletic pursuit or armed combat. And, and, and I see how he does it. Because for him and for anybody, I, I like the example, I'm going to try and follow it. You've got to be passionate about your personal life and treating it with the same kind of planning and forethought that you treat your business. Look, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I, one of the first things I did at the White House was um, tell my assistant that regardless of what happened on Mondays, I was going home at 5 o'clock so I could do homework with my 8-year-old, now 8-year-old. And I wanted to make sure that I marked off time regardless of what was happening and swirling around me. 
to ensure that I didn't forget what was most important to me. Uh, I think we all understand that successful, being successful is not always measured in monetary riches. Uh, it's measured in your happiness and your fulfillment and what you can pass on uh, to others. And that was one of the things that I made sure that I did. And, and I think if, if we all had to be at the White House at 7.30 in the morning, that was when our first meeting was. I think it was earlier for you guys. Six o'clock. Right. And to go to a 7.30 meeting, you've got to be prepared to go into a 7.30 meeting. So I didn't see my eight-year-old get ready to go to school. I didn't take him to school. Um, but if you mark off that time uh, to let them know the role they play in your life. Uh, in Washington, it's a weird culture, but I bet it happens everywhere, which is people think if you stay later at work, you're working more. And everybody can tell you what time they get to work, but not everybody can tell you what time they need to leave work. You sit at work for an extra 30 or 40 minutes, you don't really do much. You sort of play around on the computer or what have you. When you realize your to-do list is done, as Carl said, go outside of where you work, right? That work will always be there, and it may be there later on that night. But understand that when your work day is done, get out of there and go spend it with some time that, with people that really fulfill your life and make you truly rich. Okay, I'm, I uh... Well, I think that's that's a wonderful note to end on, and I, you know, it would be wonderful to have you up here all afternoon. You guys are really w incredible and and so much fun together. You really are, and I, I really are, think are it says gonna, a lot. Are you going to send us out with fireworks, uh, um, <laughs> guys? I'm a little, get it I'm together! A little, hurry I'm a little up! I'm worried about my hair. I, I just on don't want to let you on fire. You know, yeah, there's not much of a lift, and I got to be very protective of it. Well, thank you both so much well, for taking you. your time to come thank and you. share to here today with all of us. Do you appreciate them being with us and sharing these incredible insights? Thank you. You're both wonderful, and we hope you will come back again. Well, thank you. Please. Thank you. Thanks for it's having wonderful appreciate to it. meet you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Paul Rove and Robert Gibbs. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. We're going to be soon. <laughs>